Hello, this is Kirk Spano with Macro Dashes. November 17th, 2022. I just got done watching Nancy Pelosi's speech in which she said she would not run for leadership in the Democratic Party again. She had hinted at that after her husband had been attacked. And I think that this is a good moment to think about how we think about our leaders and the people who are bigger than life in business or just in the world in general, the, the influencers, the stars, and how that reflects on us. Because I think that a lot of the vitriol that has been heaped on Nancy Pelosi to the point of violence against her family, probably like everything else in politics, reflects the electorate. Nothing happens in a vacuum. So when we take a look and we make our judgment about Nancy Pelosi, take a look in the mirror too, I know that you've heard that before. For my part, I've paid more and more attention to Nancy Pelosi over the last, I'd say, decade or so. For the majority of her career, she was in the minority in the House. I don't think people realize that Republicans controlled the House uh, most of the time the last 22 years. I believe it's 14 years Republican, eight years Democrat. And so as the majority leader for eight years, she moved the needle on a lot of things. And you may or may not agree with the way the needle move, but again, in making those personal judgments, I do think that we all need to take a look in the mirror. Because when it comes to our investing, not just picking our political leaders, but when it comes to our investing, a lot of times people fall in love with the cult of personality. I think it's appropriate that just below this announcement from Pelosi, is another person that's in the news today, somebody who was larger than life, who got a lot of kudos, a lot of hip hip hoorays. And it turns out he's probably a crook and he's probably going to jail. In this interview, Sam Bankman fried, I know it's freed, but I like saying fried, tries to explain himself. If you read nothing else, or if you're just going to start reading about what really is happening with FTX and the aftermath, read this Vox article. Not Fox, Vox with a V. Very rare, I tell you, to read a Fox article. And some of the things that he says are so arrogant. Remember, I, I, I promise not to say certain words anymore. But so ukfane arrogant and devoid of a circumspect view of the world. Just so full of himself that it kind of blew my mind. So last spring, when he was buying up companies, you'll remember me saying... I'm not so sure what's going on here. It seems like a lot of money is coming out of nowhere to buy assets. I mean, it just didn't make sense to me how when the stable coins were collapsing, the various crypto businesses were going under, where he was coming up with the money to buy them. It turns out that he created a token in his own business, backed by the business, really backed by the goodwill and the future of the business, to borrow more money. So he borrowed a ton of money on Hopium, I've heard me use that term before, on Hopium, that this company would somehow cajole regulators into treating him differently. Read this article. It will blow you away, the things that he actually said. I think some of the things he said in here are going to send him to jail, and he probably should be in jail. Because of the roughly $8 billion or so that's missing, $4.1 billion of it was lent to a handful of insiders, including a billion, to Freed. And he blames us all on sloppy accounting. I'll tell you what, if I had won that lottery the other day for a billion dollars, I'd have found a way to keep track of it. If you look at this guy and you don't think that motherfucker, oh, dang, I said it, should be in prison and not minimum security. I mean, he's got to get at least get medium security where he can't, you know, watch the TV shows he wants to watch. But I don't know who goes to jail. He's a crook. He facilitated crooks. He conned other crooks, which is kind of interesting. And he wrapped it all up in a, I'm going to try to do things that are good for the world. It's just so convoluted, it's off the charts to me. This idea that, well, I can break the rules because there's a good end, right? I'm using the money for good ends. Well, I think we should have seen enough times over history that people who play outside the rules usually are in it for themselves way more than they are for anybody else. There are very few true Robin Hoods out there. And if you know the story of Robin Hood, then you know even he wasn't exempt. This guy should go to jail. And anybody who defends him, who says you really shouldn't go to jail because it's just business breakdowns, then you are tacitly agreeing to be stolen from and robbed from. May God have mercy on your portfolio and wallet. Now, 
let's pivot to an article that I put out today, and I've, I've updated it a couple times. It's a fast-moving story, and I actually thought it made sense to include something about my view. So my background on crypto, my view of crypto, and I, I think it's important that you understand this because cryptocurrencies have a lot of hype and a lot of bad information, a lot of lying, a lot of stealing, a lot of money laundering, and just generally a lot of bullshit. I think I've been clear enough on that over the last several years, really. I first learned of Bitcoin in 2012. I didn't even remember where I was sitting. I first bought Bitcoin in 2016. So I had $10,000 burning a hole in my pocket. And I was able to buy basically exactly 10 Bitcoins. I sold nine of them in 2017. When a kid at a Christmas party told me that I was wrong to tell him not to buy Bitcoin a few weeks earlier, he bought it anyway. He was up 40%. I literally sold nine of my 10 Bitcoin the next day. I had turned $10,000 into six figures. Kind of like the shoeshine boy in the old stories, giving people stock tips as they got their shoes shined. Bought it again early 2019. Sold at the end of 2019. Had to take short-term capital gain. It wasn't huge, but it was profitable. As you all know, I started telling you to buy it again uh, during the summer of 2020. Sold it late last year. Told you that too. And I've been accumulating Bitcoin again since early summer. This is all in the guise of the disclaimer that crypt, that uh, Shooter and I put at the start of some of our crypto pieces. The short story is that most cryptocurrencies are going to zero. We've been saying this for two years. There will be survivors that rise much higher. Bitcoin and Ethereum will be amongst them, and then maybe a few others. And this is a journey of separating the winners from the losers. Some of you might remember that I talked to Meb Faber. Part of our conversation included... Caution about the volatility of Bitcoin, but a belief that Bitcoin would have some future in the financial world. And then in January of this year, I interviewed cryptocurrency and accounting expert, Dr. Sean Stein-Smith, from out in New York. This is what I said in the conversation. This is directly from the transcript. I've, I've fixed some of the uh, punctuation and whatnot because Google's not good at that. Here's what I said at 27 minute mark. For somebody who's worried that they'll miss it or that they missed it, it's too late to get into Bitcoin either. I would still tell them to buy the dips. I'd be looking for big dips, 30, 40, 50% dips. I think that's the kind of volatility Bitcoin is in for. I'll probably buy some Bitcoin if it really gets down into the 20s again. You know, that twenty-seven, the $20,000 area. I think 20 to 30,000 is the range of a pretty hard floor. We've just barely gotten a little bit below that. But remember, when I said this, Bitcoin was around 50,000. At that time, most of the technical guys were saying 37,000 is the floor. And I pointed to two charts and I said 30,000 is easy to get to and it looks like 20,000 to me. But you know, I don't draw a lot of lines on my charts. I don't talk about my charts every single day. I don't do minute minute charts. I don't do hour to hour charts. My charts are based on weeks and months with the occasional daily chart right as I'm getting ready to make a transaction. Try to get that extra nickel or quarter. So I predicted that Bitcoin would basically go down to about 20,000. Gave myself some wiggle room, said maybe it stops at 30. And I think the main answer is Ethereum and Bitcoin and maybe a couple of competitors to Ethereum, just talked about one last week, are going to do well. And you know I'm on record as saying that 99, uh, should say percent, 99% of cryptos are going to zero. If 99% of the cryptocurrency out there are going to zero, what should that tell you? There is a huge problem with people just whipping out and creating cryptocurrencies backed by nothing. Very 1999. Remember the PEs into the thousands and all the negative right PEs because they didn't have earnings yet? That's what was going on in the last couple of years. And this has all been the hunt, finding what would survive. So as you read this article, the mechanics of the grayscale Bitcoin discount and everything else, in the back of your head, you should be thinking about, is there a role for Bitcoin in the financial future? Because that underlies everything. If you don't think there's a role for Bitcoin in the financial universe, then you don't want to buy the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. Here are the bullet points for what I think Bitcoin's role in the world will be. Just the bullet points, not a whole article, because each one of these could have its own, own piece. There'd be for sure a book on this. I think that U.S. frenemies and enemies, and maybe even the United States, would like to see a counterbalance to the dollar's dominance in international trade. Basically a way from keeping the dollar from spiking, especially if we suddenly start running budget surpluses in the next decade like I think is going to happen. Bitcoin can provide uh, 
an alternative to the dollar similar to the way gold has. Not a tremendous counterweight, but another counterweight. I think Bitcoin satisfies one of the definitions of money, and that is a store of value due to its scarcity and that it cannot be printed like fiat currencies. If gold is a store of value because it's scarce and people hold it, despite being heavy, then why can't Bitcoin be a store of value given it's scarce and people hold it while it's as light as light? It serves the same purposes as gold in a different format. Just because it's not physical doesn't mean that it doesn't have value. Sort of like love. No, not really like that. The super wealthy also see Bitcoin as sort of a golden passport. That is, because Bitcoin can be transferred quickly and securely when it's done right, it acts as the ultimate way to buy freedom under many circumstances. And I don't think you should underestimate the desire for people to protect themselves, even if they are good. It's not just the criminals that want protection. It's just people who are a little bit concerned about the system being abused. We've seen that before, haven't we? System being abused. Arrest people who disagree with you, Vlad, Chi, hopefully not in the United States, but I'm sure it's happened. And ultimately, institutions and family offices, which now own at least 5% or more of Bitcoin, is growing fast, their, their ownership. And if I believe anything, it's follow the big money. So that's why I think that the underlying thesis of Bitcoin makes sense. So Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, which we talked about in the article today, certain mechanical reasons that it trades at a discount, because it essentially trades like a closed-end fund. So it's subject to discounts and premiums. Unlike an ETF, which, does, which is designed to correct very quickly any discounts or premiums. And that is through the unique creation and redemption process that ETFs use. You can go here to Nuveen and they explain it. Why does the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust trade at a discount? There's a number of reasons. Lately, it's been because of the forced selling and the panic selling of Bitcoin, dragging the whole price down of Bitcoin. But that discount is because a lot of people just don't want to hold an intermediary. In a non-qualified account, an account where you can actually buy Bitcoin, why would you buy Grayscale? You pay somebody a 2% management fee to hold your Bitcoin for you if you don't have to. You can just buy Bitcoin at Coinbase or wherever. You can leave it there if you trust them. Leaving it at FTX would have been a bad idea. Coinbase, I trust. I don't keep you everything there. I keep most of it in cold storage. I've encouraged you to actually buy Bitcoin directly. The grayscale Bitcoin trust is if you want to put a percent or two in your IRA because you want crypto exposure there. Outside of an IRA, just buy Bitcoin. So will the gap get closed on the discount? Right now, grayscale is suing the SEC to become an ETF because the SEC told them no. I think grayscale is going to win. Why do I think they're going to win? Because look, if they're going to allow gold ETFs that are physical, physical gold ETFs that hold bullion, that's hard to move and frankly hard to account for, why wouldn't they allow Bitcoin spot ETFs or physical Bitcoin ETFs? As long as Bitcoin's legal, there's not really an argument against it. Now, if Bitcoin gets outlawed, which doesn't seem likely given that the government and most of the governments of the world are starting to own it. I don't think there's a legal standing for SEC to do what it's doing. So does that mean that the SEC just took a bad position because they took a bad position? No, I think there's more to it. I think the SEC needs and wants Congress to step in and create rules in certain jurisdictions for different parts of the crypto market, cryptocurrencies, stable coins, things like that. I think that largely the SEC was creating a delay. They knew that there was going to be a blow up. Everybody knew there was going to be a blow up. Nobody knew who it was going to be. I suspected FTX several months ago, talked about it, never put a bet on it. Just said the guy looked shady and looked like he wasn't trustworthy to me. Showed up in shorts and a t-shirt. Oh, that's my shtick, man. I'm so cool. When people do stuff like that, they're being disrespectful. They're being arrogant. It's not casual Friday, bro. You know, at least wear khakis and a polo. Come on, man. I do that when I go downtown. I wear something different than I wear in my in my in my spare room. You know, I wear a lot of Adidas wear in my spare room. But I go downtown. You know, I wear some slacks and, and a polo, or sometimes I wear a button down. I even put a tie on once in a while still. It's a show of respect. And Fry Guy, right? So disrespectful that you know I'm too cool, man. I'm a billionaire. I made it up, but you'll never find out. Oops, found out. I think the SEC wants regulation, and I think the collapse of FTX is going to bring it on. There is a big risk for Grayscale out there. 
And I say big because we don't know what's behind the next door. And this is why you would wait a while to buy GBTC because you have time before the ETF news comes out. We'll make sure that Grayscale survives. It looks like they will. But there is some common ownership through a parent company. They have a sister company, brother company, whatever you want to call it. A company on the platform of Digital Currency Group, which owns a ton of companies, with a company called Genesis, which the Winklevoss twins are involved with. The guys who Zuckerberg stole Facebook from. So, I mean, it's not like they're buddies. You know, they're not, I mean, they're next to each other in the alphabet. But it looks like they don't do business together. But Genesis is on the hook for $175 million of FTX. And it looks like they got bailed out today. It's like it's giving them $140 million. So you just got to make sure that that's not imaginary digital currency group money. It's going to end up going the way of FTX. I'd love to see Grayscale just get spun off all the way. Completely separate it. Now, if there's a contagion, what you're worried about is that FTX brings down Genesis. And that brings down the entirety of digital currency group. I don't think FTX was that integrated into the full system of cryptocurrency to create that type of contagion. The numbers just don't add up to that. And FTX was the third biggest, basically the same size as Coinbase. And whereas Coinbase isn't really levered up in any meaningful way, FTX was apparently levered up quite a bit. And to me, they laundered money to those executives, $4 billion worth which is around half of what they say they're short. So as Fry Guy runs around saying, well, I, I shouldn't have declared bankruptcy. I, I regret it now. And I just want to raise the $8, mil, $8 billion and pay everybody back. Well, how about starting with the billion that they gave you as a loan? Why don't you pay that back? Maybe sell off your Robinhood holdings that you're holding separately. You fucking punk. You know, Charlie Munger is saying the same thing. He's a punk. There's other punks in the world right now too. Anyway. Bitcoin's role in the world. Here's who should buy grayscale Bitcoin trust. And maybe not right this minute. If you believe that Bitcoin has a role in the financial world, that grayscale is not at some risk of contagion from FTX. And if the grayscale Bitcoin trust eventually becomes an ETF, which will cause the NAV uh, discount to disappear because that's how it works. then I think this is something you can put a couple percent of into your IRA if you want Bitcoin exposure in your IRA. You don't want to put a lot in your IRA. I know people who have like their whole IRA in Bitcoin in this fund, actually. Well, that's just stupid. That's, I've told you what this type of an asset is about a hundred times. I'll tell you again. It is not a stock. It is digital gold. Would you ever put a hundred percent of your money into gold? No. So don't put a lot of money into this either. This is good for a few percent if you have this type of aggressive investment in the first place, if you're retired and you have an IRA that you draw income from, you probably don't want this. If you have a Roth IRA that you intend to pass on when you die tax-free, maybe a couple percent in here because that should be a growthy account. So you have to know what your risk tolerance is. You have to have the right financial structure, right types of accounts and the right goals to buy this. If you check all those boxes, and if Grayscale doesn't go down because of FTX in the next few weeks, then you should probably buy this because the SEC has briefs going in the ETF trial in the next couple of weeks, due December 9th. Grayscale will respond. Final briefs are in February. And at that point, the negotiating will get hot and heavy. By then, I would expect that Congress has announced hearings on how to do regulations. So taking the things that they've accomplished in the last couple of years and fast tracking it, say, look, we, okay, who's going to regulate what? Let's start writing these rules, which are actually already happening. So we have to be very aware of what dominoes fall. You know, is there really a contagion or is this just an unwinding of leverage? I believe there's theft in the case of FTX. And now a lot of leverage is getting unwound. In that interview with Sean uh, Stein Smith, Dr. Sean Stein Smith, I point out that the leverage in crypto at the time was about 100 to 1, which we know is insane. That implies a 90 to 96% reduction in that market. So with a lot of things going to zero, the survivors are going to be really strong, really well capitalized, and have the whole future to themselves. We've seen this story play out before. Real estate 15 years ago, banking a couple times. That's what this is. This is the incredible unwinding of leverage 
and it's going to lead to certain things. One of those things is that there's a few decentralized exchanges that force you to do a little bit more, do the buying and storage to actually understand what this is about. Those will become more popular. More sophisticated investors are already using them. And of course, the regulation I just talked about. There are legitimate reasons why Bitcoin should exist. There are functional purposes. And while the Bitcoin maximalists, the ones who believe that Bitcoin is going to take over the financial universe, wiping out government-backed fiat currencies while bringing world peace, feeding the hungry, giving us all 80-year retirements, powering our cars, and being able to fight off alien invasions right after the Bitcoin deflects a killer asteroid, something like that. Bitcoin maximalists, things they believe are silly. But like any silly story, any lie, there can be an element of truth. In fact, the best lies have an element of truth. When you peel out the elements of truth, there's applications for that. So when I throw away all the bullshit, when I shovel it away, and I put it in my carbon capture machine, turn it into renewable gas or sustainable aviation fuel, I look at it and I say, okay, what are the functional things that Bitcoin can be used for? And is this an investment that takes advantage of that? And the answer is yes, under the right circumstances for the right people with the right accounts, the right time frames. I had to tell somebody, I mean, I have to tell one guy, stop trading. He's just running around, chicken head off. Do you understand these technical indicators? No. Why the hell are you trading? You can't be a trader if you don't understand technical indicators. You're, you're, you're trading against supercomputers that are owned by hedge funds and institutional investors with microwave internet connections so they can front run your trade because they see it a millionth of a second before it goes through and you're dealing with proprietary traders and retired traders on from the floor of the exchanges who now just manage their own money because they made so much of it then you have a small group of experienced day traders that are good at it then you have all the people who want to get rich quick who just run back and forth and we know from tax records, 80% of them lose. You're not looking for a trade here, folks. You're looking for ownership. Ownership comes from the things on the screen right now. Do you believe these things? Can you find a way to understand it? Do you have the time? If you do, which is why you're in an investment letter, figure it out. Be greedy when everybody else is fearful. Something in here is screaming that. If Bitcoin stays legal, and I mean, nobody even talks about making it illegal anymore. The government is basically behind it. They, they want Bitcoin to exist. I think for this reason, I don't think we want the dollar to be so strong that it crushes the global economy. Bitcoin's just another thing that nicks away at the dollar, which as I've explained, and I predicted it way ahead of time in 2012. And then when Joe Biden got elected, I told you how strong the dollar was going to be. First, I told you long-term bull market. And then I told you when Biden was elected, that, that marked the bottom for the dollar for a long time that it was going to go much higher. And it has. And that's a hard message for me to get through to people because all they hear is, whoa, 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 whoa dollar crash. The dollar's going to crash. Fiat currency, dollar crash, dollar crash, dollar crash. It's bullshit, folks. The United States is a great country. We don't need to be made great again. We are the dominant economic, military, diplomatic power on the planet. And nobody is close. China is like a little brother kicking her ankles. Russia is smaller than that. A little Vladdy's going to get stepped on soon. So when we take a look at some of these funds, this is what was in DAP, which we own a little bit of about a month ago. This is what's in it today. Notice the two stocks at the top of the list. Are these not the two stocks that I told you were the best ones? They've climbed to the top of the list for holdings based on the factor-based model here combination of value and momentum and growth. MicroStrategy just holds a ton of Bitcoin. Marathon Digital, we traded profitably. Silvergate, I told you a long time ago, is an interesting company. I didn't quite understand the model. It turns out that they've been laundering money for bad guys. They're going to get in trouble for it. But they basically are a bank for crypto that once they're regulated, and I don't know what that implies for their valuation, probably going to be a big deal. So unless the government says you're so bad that we have to crush you. Silvergate's interesting here. There's some big investors buying it, and there's a lot of people shorting it. This is a battleground stock, no doubt about it. That's one to watch. It's only 4% of the fund. If you go over here to ARKW, this one owns some of the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. The reason I did not recommend ARKW is because I can own the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust directly if I want, my IRA. And in my non-qualified accounts, I just buy Bitcoin. 
then store it properly. This is the one that I like, either to replace DAP, or I guess if you don't have a ton of DAP and you want to hold, hold the DAP you have, then add another fund, this one. It's a, a broader based fintech fund, right? Shopify, which is down whatever it's down, 80% or something. They're a big deal in digital commerce. Then Block and Coinbase are right there. Still get some real nice exposure. Mercado Libre, emerging markets, right? E-commerce, global uh, emerging markets, really beat up right now. Twilio, I'm not a huge fan of Robinhood, uh, but I do think it's a takeover target. DraftKings, well, we, we had a little experience with the guy that's involved there, right? You guys remember that? The Golden Nugget deal that fell through? So... In any case, I think the combination of ARCF and DAP and GBTC and individual Bitcoin and Ethereum holdings, I think some large single digit percentage for aggressive investors is appropriate. You know, maybe go up to 10 to 12 percent if you're really aggressive. Combination of all these things together because blockchain is forever as far as we're concerned. Digital contracts are coming. Bitcoin is the alternative store of value that we've been looking for. There's nothing else even close to me. It's either Bitcoin or nothing. There's not going to be a different Bitcoin. There's nothing else out there. If Bitcoin doesn't survive, then there won't be cryptocurrencies that are stores of value. I don't think. I could be wrong about that, but it's just hard to imagine somebody saying we're the better Bitcoin. Bitcoin has developed its lightning network and has developed everything else that needs to develop. If there were shortcomings, it's going to end up being the thing. And, and the thing you got to realize about Bitcoin I've never said it would be a replacement for the dollar. You're never going to buy your pizza with it. Read that article. There's a link for that phrase. I keep saying that because there's a story behind it. Bitcoin is never going to be something that you shop with unless you're buying the entire pizza chain. And then maybe somebody will say, give me some Bitcoin in the deal. All right? Aaron Rodgers said to the Packers, I want a percentage of my income in Bitcoin. Not looking like a great idea right now. I had imagined he's, it's a week to week thing. You know, he gets paid whatever he gets paid $2 million a week to not make the playoffs. So that's in Bitcoin. So some of it's at a low price because the dollar cost averaged in, like I've been telling you to do for six months, five, six months, dollar cost average in, because this isn't something where you're looking for a 20 or 30% gain. You're looking for a double or a triple or a quadruple over a period of years. And this is one of the fastest growing industries in the world. The winners in the shakeout, right? The survivors in the shakeout will be big winners. Somebody on this list you're looking at is going to go bankrupt. Somebody on this list is going to go up tenfold. Buy the basket, unless you know these companies inside and out, you can pick which is which. I look at these companies all the time. And to me, Square has the most upside because of its integration with small business and its online business. And the fact that it decided to buy Bitcoin pretty good prices. And I don't think anybody accounts for that in the share price right now. Coinbase, I think, has long ago swallowed its whole DeFi attitude and has worked smartly with BlackRock and some others to integrate itself into the global financial system. They don't really have any leverage to speak of that we know of. They don't run a lending program. There's no signs that they're doing any of the things that FTX did. The fact that they're acting as the firm that BlackRock uses to sell cryptocurrencies to institutional investors and rich people tells me a lot. All right, I'm going to finish with one thing here. I just want to show you a headline. In a first, the U.S. signals support for U.N. agreement to phase down fossil fuels. First time ever. But here's the exception. But the new U.S. support comes with a condition that the phase out refer only to unabated fossil fuels, meaning those burned without technology to capture the carbon dioxide emissions at the smokestack. That technology is known as carbon capture and storage, CCS, but it's in use at just 18 facilities around the world right now, almost all industrial, used at one coal power plant, I think in Kentucky. We have an investment in this already, don't we? Two, two actually. And by a degree of separation, three, a pipeline company. What are our four steps to investing? Look for the secular trends and see what government policy and central bank policy are impacting, you know, where they're pushing money, then the fundamentals and then the technicals. Companies that have a role in carbon capture are going to do very well because there's no way to ramp up to alternative energy overnight. It's going to take 20, 30 years. And even though I think there's an inflection point coming in four or five years, it's still a process. And as we electrify the transportation fleets, at least the smaller vehicles, there's a lot that goes with that. More transmission, more generation, 
or charging stations, modified houses, new ways to build houses and other buildings. Big, big thing. I've showed you the pie chart. So I just showed you this to end because this is central to our thesis of investing in the fourth industrial revolution, decarbonization and digitization of the economy. This is the decarbonization part. When the United States says we'll help working on using you know less fossil fuels, which duh, because we're going to run out someday anyway, but we want to make it okay for carbon capture, which we happen to be really good at and have the technology for and have a head start in all those businesses, pay attention because those businesses are going to do well because not only is the government giving them money right now, but they're forcing the rest of the world to use them. Talk about creating a market and dominating it. All right. So as you all know, this is not a show for talking about specific stocks. Now, this is more big picture and ETFs. So I will talk about several stocks in the energy space on Monday, along with the uh, new uh, Stocks of the Week article, which I've been working on for a month, and it's pretty cool. All right, I'll talk to you on Monday. Look for a little bit more out this weekend as I get into the new publishing schedule.